John Otway, welcome to Noise11.com. I, I, I beg your pardon, uh, do, do I refer to you as Dr. John Otway? Oh, I know. So it's astonishing. I um, I got a, a, a degree in, um, in music from Oxford Brookes University last year, and um, which sort of annoyed my band because I, I, I'm not the um, I'm not by, by far not the best musician in the band, but I am the most qualified musician in the band. <laughs> and my part, my partner of long standing, um, a wild Willie Barrett, who's a you know, a, an incredible instrumentalist, based sort of like a five string banjo, um, fiddle, um, slide guitar, guitar, anything with strings on beautifully. Um, he has, you know, he hasn't got um, any quali music qualifications, and uh, I do. Yeah, I'm I, sort of a, a doctor of music. <laughs> oh, that's very, very impressive. Well, you know, I guess you are the educator, aren't you? You uh, you have done a book um, that was quite. Yeah, two books. I did it hot way. Yes. In fact, there's two books, um, two autobiographies, because I've had two hits. So <laughs> there's a, <laughs> an autobiography for each hit, really. <laughs> That's the way to go. And the movie, too, um, Rock and Roll's Greatest Failure, Rotway the Movie, premiere in 2013. And I love the story about how you created the final scene uh, on the red carpet as people were arriving for the movie. Yes, because we funded that. We actually funded the movie by um, selling tickets for the premiere, and then we credited um, credited all, all the people um, as producers, basically, because they sort of funded the film. So um, we got a red carpet, and um, y y y as you do for your premiere, and uh, we filmed that. And while the film was actually getting shown, um, the director was editing up the last five minutes, which was everybody arriving um, on the red carpet. Which is great for the audience because as the end of the movie came up, there they all were coming into the cinema. Did were they aware that that was going to happen? I would imagine that'd be a what the fuck type moment, wouldn't it? Well, it's quite interesting because we got them to film the uh, fund the film and come to the premiere, but they had absolutely no idea what, what way the movie was going to be or what it was going to be like. Um, so it, no, that was quite, quite an eye opener <laughs> in a lot of ways. And what was funny because um, in, in those cinemas at premieres, they have people, the, the, the you know, the side of the uh, stage, security people, making sure people are filming the, um, you know, filming the, yeah. the movie on their phones, and yeah. they, they they've got these glasses. Um, but when the credits came up, suddenly they were getting bombarded because sort of like everybody was sort of filming their name coming <laughs> up, on, coming up on the big screen. And uh, yeah, the projectionist said it's the only time he's ever known the whole audience stay there for all the credits. <laughs> yeah, Rock and Roll's Greatest Failure, the name of the movie, is interesting that you really have made a success out of failure in your own words, even to the point of going out and lecturing that. Yeah, well, what happened was when my career sort of hit its sort of uh, a, a really bad point, um, I just wrote a self effacing autobiography. I mean, I just thought I'd make it a bit different because most rock autobiographies is the artists sort of like complaining about, you know, how bad the management and record company were and how they messed up their career. And I thought it'd be funny because it was true to have the record company and the management as the good guys who would try, try really hard to get it right. And the artist was the one that has completely messed it up. And it was a very funny book, and I managed to get a major publishing deal, and they said, we're going to market you as rock and roll's greatest failure. <laughs> so I had to go out and sell myself as this, which I found was absolutely dead easy. You know, rather than sort of go to everybody and say, this is my great, the next record is absolutely brilliant, you could go, want to know why, why my career's gone bad? Just play my record. <laughs> and I just found that sort of humour just... Um, not, I was naturally good at it, you know. Um, probably, yeah, probably because, uh, yeah, yeah. we well, kind of uh, kicked off as a success, didn't you? I think there was a huge record advance, uh, right in the early well, days in Polydor Records in the 1970s. Yeah, I mean, uh, I got a record um, today that would be worth millions, and um, uh, I got paid. Um, um, my advance on my record company was um, something like, um, Ten times the amount that was given to the jam by the same record company. 
But as I point out, the the, the record company did uh, uh, made a lot lot more profit from the jam <laughs> than, than they did with me. They never never quite recouped the millions that they gave me. Yes. Did you did you spend all that money on the record? Um, oh, I, I mean, the advance. Yeah, no, that that that, that didn't last very long at all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I thought, but uh, what, I mean, one of the first things I did. People sort of say, "Where did you know? You, where did it you go wrong?" I mean, one of the first things was I thought I'd cracked the um, the UK, and I thought I'd just try and crack America. And um, I discovered that the Americans had a slightly different sense of humour to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 uh, you know, whereas the, the, the British sort of like te- said, tend to celebrate failures, the Americans <laughs> tend to do the opposite. It's not really the American way. Um, but I mean, I played um, Adelaide Finns, I say, earlier this year, and I found out that um, oh, this, the Australians were amused by it. So. <laughs> Yeah, I, th- I think it's probably a Commonwealth humour because the yeah. Canadians <laughs> share it, the New Zealanders share it, the Australians and the English definitely share it, but the Americans just don't get it. No, they don't get it. The Canadians do. They, well, we've still got a bunch of fans in Canada when we go back and play to them every so often. Yeah. Well, you clearly had uh, plenty of money to slap around at one point. Didn't you buy a Bentley? Yes. Well, I was because um, when we got all, all the money from... Uh, uh, Polydor, uh, we had an accountants meeting and they suggested that a, go- a, a, a good thing to do was use some of the money to buy a car. And so I, <laughs> I mean, this is absolutely ridiculous from what I was going to say. Um, I didn't realise that they meant only if you can drive is it a good idea <laughs> to buy a car. I just thought, no, they meant buy a car. So um, I couldn't drive, so I got uh, so whereas the, uh, the the manager went and bought a sort of like a, a proper estate car to cart all car, car, the merchandising gear around. Um, I bought a nineteen forty nine Bentley because yeah. I thought that was a rock star's car, and I couldn't drive, so I had to pay people to drive me around in it. <laughs> it wasn't really the wisest choice of uh, um, no. No, probably better uses for the money. The accountant should have started off by saying, can you drive? (laughs) There's some amazing names that I see attached to you, like Pete Townsend, uh, who was an absolute legend when you were working with him in the 70s. How did your paths cross? Well, what happened was, I mean, this goes right back to 1972. I'd, I'd just out quite realistically that it was going to be difficult for me to get a record deal. And so I um I made I pressed up my, my own single and um I recorded it um uh, went to the studio with William recorded us recorded a single and I pre- pressed it up and there's a DJ over here called John Peel or was DJ called John Peel who was very very good at picking up on grassroots things and started playing my record on Radio One and Pete Townsend heard it liked it and um, offered to produce a proper version and. Um, Took us to a you know um, Olympic studio in Barnes, where and um, um, you know recorded four tracks, which were on the first album. Mm. We managed to get a single uh, hit single in the charts in '77, uh, really yeah. free. Was that was that one of the four songs that Pete worked? No, on? No, no, that, that, that was a, that was a different. Uh, that, that was uh, um, Willie produced that that oh. one. But uh, but here well, we have um, John Otway, the pop star, because you're in the top forty. Oh yeah, no, 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 that was great. You know, I'd always wanted to be a pop star and it was great, great. And you know, get that hit in 77. I the only thing was I didn't realise it was going to take 25 years before I'd get another hit. <laughs> You're also in the final episode of The Young Ones, too. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um uh, uh, um Rick Mail was Rick Mail was a bit of a fan and um yeah, sort of got got me to do to do the um last episode of The Young Ones, which is a really neat thing to do. <laughs> that would have been a lot of fun. Um, now, recording at Abbey Road, like, these are just uh, hi- historic and iconic places that I keep reading about, um, again, attached to your name. And, uh, you know, going into the hallowed halls of Abbey Road, what was that like for, you know, a a, a new uh, recording artist to be in the place where all those great records were made? I'll tell you what was was quite funny about that because we went to do a recce of Abbey Road before we recorded there, and um, the guy was 
Um, the guy was taking us around. We were going to basically, uh, people used to heckle when I did House of the Rising Sun, so we put, decided for the B-side um, of, of the single was coming out, we'd, we'd record them all heckling. Um, so anyway, the guy's taking me around, and I started asking questions. Now, which studio did, and he was expecting a sort of like a Beatles or something like that, and I said, uh, which record did, uh, studio did Benny Hill record the fastest milkman in the West in? You can see his face drop. Like, well, what on earth are you asking that for? So that was quite funny because when I, uh, the reason I asked when when we got all the fans, uh, fa you know, the thousand fans to sort of like do the heckles, um, I could go on and say, this is a sacred place. Do you realise Benny Hill recorded <laughs> Ernie, the fastest milkman in West, where you're standing now? <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea that was done at Abbey Road. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd read it somewhere, and I just thought that was an amusing comment. Um, but it, it's, it's quite interesting, Abbey Road, because, uh, I mean, I thought it was quite a, a, neat play, a neat thing to go and record at Abbey Road. But for the band, my band, the, the, you know, it was like going into a cathedral for them. And then for the Thousand Dot Way fans that turned up, they, they were like in awe, in awe of the place. Mm. Um, and I just, such a, such a special day, you know, and... Um, you know, even now, you know, is you know, one, you know, some of the fans have turned up, go and say, you know, I recorded at Abbey Road Studios. So, yeah, wow. that's great. And the you know the the fans, as you say, these Otway fans are quite uh, insane, aren't they? You can just say that you're going to do a concert on the other side of the world, and they buy tickets and jump on planes. Yeah, um, um, not Otway fans are good. Yes, we. I always felt that. The, you, you know, the entertainment um, with, with me shouldn't start when I go on stage and finish when I come off. I always thought it was more embracing than that. So, the, you know, you could do things like say to the fans that we really need to have another hit. You know, the joke was we need to get the S on the right side of the word hit. <laughs> <laughs> and, That's um, good. I'm going to use that line. <laughs> Uh, and so, so we put, you know, uh, you know, put together a big campaign, and um, you, you know, we used them like um, a, a record company with lots and lots of employee, you know, employees basically. And we managed to we managed to get another hit. And likewise with the movie, you know, we um, by crediting uh, or or as a movie. And um, 2016 for the last album, uh, 50 of them flew over to um, Montserrat, and when we were recording the album at Sir George Martin's place. So mm. we've had a lot of good adventures together. Yeah. Well, Gib Gibraltar was recently, wasn't it? But yeah, that's right. Um, over in um, in England, we um, or in Britain, we voted for Brexit, which has caused all sorts of chaos over here. But one of the upshots was it's difficult to sort of like take the um, go, go and play um, in you know in in Europe and um, Gibraltar's in the Mediterranean and it's actually British. So that was actually quite good. You could actually go there with no work uh, permits yeah. um, with all your gear and play there. And none of us have been to Gibraltar before. So for the 30th anniversary of the band, because we managed to keep the band together, you know, 30 years without a lineup change. We had a, had, had a party over there and a load of fans joined in. So, yeah. Well, you did attempt to come to Australia before, didn't you, uh, by bringing all the, the fans to, over on the plane? Or... I know. That, 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 that was a, a rock and roll's greatest failure disaster. Um, when we had the second hit, it sort of went to my head and I thought I could do anything. Um, and I discovered you couldn't. And one of the things you couldn't do was chart your own 747 and fly around the world playing places like uh, Sydney Opera House, Carnegie Hall and... <laughs> <laughs> and it just went spectacularly wrong. Um, and, uh, yeah, ouch. You're associated with so many, uh, you know, big and famous songs. I think uh, Where Do We Go To, My Lovely, was a song that you were uh, doing continuously when Peter Starsdent was alive. Was he aware that you were uh, performing that song? Um, yes, he was, because a mate of mine... Um, uh, who, who was my roadie? Um, went and roadied for Peter Sarsted as well, and we ended up in this um in this pub one one evening together. And um, I, 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 um my mate Peter Bullock said to him, "Um, oh, where does where do you go to, my lovely?" And, and he, he decided to do a duo version, but he didn't realise what my my version was like. 
because uh, when we got up to he said, do you do it with the E minor or the A minor? And I said, doesn't really matter, does it? <laughs> <laughs> and I was going, yes, you do. And I was going, no, you don't. Oh, yeah. yes, you do. No, 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 you <laughs> don't. And he walked up and said, I don't know whether I should have done that. <laughs> 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 yes. One song that I, I was surprised that you did was Rolf Harris, Two Little Boys. You must regret that one now. Um, oh, funny enough, we, we 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 still do it. Um, because we were doing, and this is actually true, we were doing it before Rolf Harris was doing it. It's a, 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 a traditional um uh song uh, from the from the American Civil War, I think. I think it's the American Civil War. And um Willie was doing it as um uh, what, what with his like, really nice finger picking of uh, uh fluttering banjo, mm. and uh, so we do so we, we do do it and sort of say we can do this because we were doing it first. What do we get in the Australian shows? Well, you get two hits. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it'll be a very short show, then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, two, two hits and the B sides. <laughs> and then it's pretty obvious that if nothing else we play in the show, it's going to be a hit. <laughs> And we did two we did two sets normally, so it's quite good because we can, you know, start each set with a hit and so it can go down from there. Yeah. Because <laughs> I think uh, you know, back in the early days when you started off, while Willie Barrett uh, was your partner in that, um, you've still done stuff with him over uh, the years, oh, including recently. Oh yeah, no, yeah, no, we just done a um a 40 date tour, half a century, 50 years of up and Barrett, which is great. Um and a lot of the dates, you know, a good half of the dates completely sold out, which it's great when you think about it. Fifty, you're fifty years after you started, sort of like a, do a tour and sort of selling out a lot of the dates, and um, people still coming out to see us. Hmm. Um, my mum always thought, you know, I'd have to get a proper job, <laughs> and what's really quite neat is the fact that um, you know all, 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 all my sisters have now retired, and I'm the only one left working. <laughs> oh dear! Did your mum ever go get to go for a ride in the Bentley? Oh yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. yeah, yeah, you've got to show off, isn't it? Show off to your parents. So yeah. Um I obviously wasn't driving it. <laughs> Still very impressive. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's 1949 Bentley. Um I, I had to sell it when my career went downhill, but I keep looking for it so that you know to sort of try and buy it again just to prove I haven't learned anything. I I I um I'm I just just tell David I am really looking forward to coming over. All right, we'll we'll be seeing you when you get here then, John. Ah, uh, brilliant! Cheers. <laughs>